Good morning, church. Hello, hello. So good to gather with you. Those of you who are here in person, welcome. Those of you who are gathering online, we're so glad that we could all be together and combine to turn our focus and our purpose on towards God. It's my, my name is David Werner, and I'm the pastor here, and it's my joy to welcome you and to encourage you to um, feel connected to Evangel Church, for we love God together, we love one another, and we serve as the hands and feet of Jesus in our world. We do that wherever we are on our own, but we do it together as we link arms one-on-one -on -one together and able to make a difference in a way that we cannot in other ways. On Wednesday, we were here on site for a worship service for our Lenten journey, and Pastor Susie taught us about how Jesus is our living water. And she, used, she brought in a plant um, from, from their house, and I want you to see the plant on the screen over there. It was a very droopy plant needing water desperately. So how the without the living water we are like that we get droopy and we don't able to we aren't able to thrive. Well, that plant is up here in the front. You see it over here. Here it is, looking much differently now, very much more vibrant, alive, and looking good. And t today we are um, having our theme for our worship today is standing on the solid rock of Jesus. And we stand for Jesus. We need to have his stability in our lives. And he is the living water that refreshes and renews us and gives us life abundant. But it's not just so that we can feel vibrant. It's also so that we can look vibrant. So when others look at us and how we live and what we do day by day, they can see the difference Jesus makes. And so when we are standing for Jesus, like on a stand, um, this plant, when we look vibrant and healthy, others can see that Jesus is our living water and makes us able to live abundantly. And that's part of our witness. That's what we're doing here today. We are gathering in God's name. We are turning, shifting and turning our focus onto God so that we can experience his rejuvenating grace. So we, we, go, we go to our, 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 our opening hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. We hang on to Jesus. We are heading to Jerusalem, making our stand with, with, with Jesus, and we glory in the cross that our Savior has. Let's sing. Please stand with me.
Our memory verse for this week is a calling for us to be of courage and to stand firm in, in the following that we have after Jesus. So this is from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Let's try this together. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. You may be seated. Thank you. We come to God and we know that he gives us the living water who is Jesus and renewing strength and makes us able to stand, makes us able to face whatever we are facing ahead. And we, we have that joy for us as we gather together, but we also want this joy for others around us. Part of our following of Jesus is to also go and share this Jesus with, with, with wherever, wherever we, we go. So if you are worshiping with, with us um, remotely, uh, online, wherever you are at, you are already in the mission field. And so re, be mindful that God is using you as a witness, an example, right now where you are, to point others to the hope of the living water we have in Jesus. For those of us who are here in person, we are gathering together, and we are feeling that connection with each other, and we commit with each other to go commit in lives of service and witness to our world as we go from this place as well. So we have that we, we have a calling to be this agents for God in our world by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. So whenever we gather in worship, we always praise God with, our, with the gifting of, of praise. We also give offerings of what God has already given us, giving it to God's work to be shared so that others might know Jesus. And so you can give, if you're here in person, you can give um, in the baskets by the doors as you leave the sanctuary here. Please give your offerings there. Or you can give also um, electronically. If you're at home, you can give electronically or online. You can give that by, so if you want to just scan in the QR code, there's one in the bulletin here. You can do that. If you're at home, you can scan in right off the screen. That should work for you. Scan the QR code. You can take it to our church's giving site where you can give um, to the church's work. And there's also ways of designating specialized giving as well. So you, so you can direct your monies in the way that God is calling you. But we also give of our praise and adoration always to God. And so we're going to do that right now, give an offering of praise. And the choir is going to lead us in a praise offering. And we're going to join the choir as we sing the doxology together.
Yes, glory be to you, O God, the giver of life and the plan for abundance for us. And you shower upon us more than we could ever ask or imagine. And you will even call us into work with you. So take these now, our offerings of our lives, and make them a part of your ministry in a way where you are glorified and you are honored. Use us, O God, for we are your offering, and we dedicate our lives to you. In Christ's name we, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. After Jesus was arrested in Jerusalem, and after he was falsely condemned by the Jewish court, he was sent to the Roman governor or prefect to be sentenced. Listen for how Pontius Pilate found Jesus not guilty, but still had him sentenced to death. Notice especially the name of the place where Pilate handed down his judgment against Jesus. Hear these words from the book of John 19, 1 through 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to them to be crucified. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The stones cry out, Law given. Law fulfilled. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We've been walking with Jesus, walking the stony path. We've been listening to the stones, and they cry out the story of salvation throughout the Bible story, all along the way as well. We've heard them shout of paradise gained and lost, of our sin, of God's power, and of God fighting for us. But now we're finally getting close. We can see Jerusalem in the distance. It won't be long now. By next Sunday, we'll be at the gate ready to go in. But as you can see, Jerusalem is up on a hill. Everyone always goes literally up to Jerusalem. But that also means that from now on, the journey gets especially steep. 
The closer we get to, to Jerusalem, the harder it gets. And the Jews are, and the Jesus we're traveling with has warned us that when we finally get there, it doesn't get any easier. Actually, it gets worse. Do you see the gleaming stone walls of Jerusalem? There, rising above it, is the temple. The temple marks the very place where God resides on earth. And do you know what the temple was built for? What's supposed to be inside? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was given thousands of years ago back in the desert when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt. God had freed them from slavery and was taking them into the land he had promised to them. And along the way, God has the people make a pit stop right by a big mountain named Sinai or Horeb. And he calls their leader, Moses, to climb up the mountain so that the Lord may give them some instructions. For you see, God had freed the Israelites, but now he is desiring to create a kind of society, his people living in the way that he wanted them to live. He wanted them to form them as a people by giving them a set of core values, rules, founding principles upon which they could build their lives. And this, this, this foundation revealed God's very nature, built upon his own person, his personality. It's a, it's a self-revelation going on here. <clears throat> The instructions he gave, he gave them as a vision of his own being. Live like me. And so he gave them the moral law, summarized on two tablets, which we call the Ten Commandments. Pastor Susie shared them with us a couple weeks ago. And the giving of the moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments, God says that his people must live differently, in a different way. He's calling them to be a holy people, living differently than everybody else around them, to be distinct and unique, so that they can then be an influence and an agent of change in the world, a leavening, a seasoning in the world. So God also gave them what we call now the, the ritual laws, the Jewish laws. Some of those we know as the kosher laws. The Jews can't eat certain things, have to eat certain things in certain ways. They can't do certain practices, and they hold certain observances. And a crucial part of these ritual laws <clears throat> are the laws around the religious practices, observances, and the temple and the system of sacrifices that God introduces. God, you see, opens to the Israelite, the, 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 the people, the doors of salvation, providing a, a temporary system for making atonement for sin, to, 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 for them to give access to forgiveness and to show how to pay the price of death that human sin brings. The rituals of animal sacrifices provided living creatures to be substituted in our place and to suffer the human penalty of death that our sin requires. But remember, it's only a, a temporary system. This is God's first giving of the, of the first covenant, not the full plan yet. And so we have 613 laws in all, which we can find in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <clears throat> laws that form the Israelites as a people, as a nation, and as a religion, and form them in the very character and the very nature of, of God. Laws that form the Israelites as a people, but form them to look like God's way of life. God's very nature and being in our world. 
And so God had them build an ark, a decorated box, to house this covenant. Inside the ark, the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments are placed. And on top of it is a cover put on that box. The cover of the ark is called the mercy seat. And it symbolized that God would always give mercy to his people as they followed his laws and way of life. The mercy seat is decorated by two angels, or cherubim, with their wings pointing inward. And the Israelites believed that God's spiritual presence came down and rested on top of this ark on the mercy seat in between the wings of the cherubim. So God's nature is mercy. That's how they knew what the kind of God they had would be like. So the ark is the seat of God <clears throat> who comes to dispense mercy. And then that is proved a, a, a physical sign that God was actually with them directly. His presence came down off the mountain and rested on the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was able to be um, moved and taken with them wherever they went. And it was first housed in what's called the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a tent structure that moved with the Israelites as they wandered throughout the desert. So God would always, always be with them. His mercy was always there. And the way of life, of abundant life, of good living, was always there, leading them. When they finally made it to the promised land, Kings David and Solomon built a permanent stone structure, the temple in Jerusalem, to house the ark. The people would always know that God would be there. They could see a place where he was. So can you see this temple with its stones covered in gold off in the distance? Inside, housing the precious gift of God, the law, the way of life, a revelation of God's very character carved into two stone tablets sitting within a stone structure atop a mountain of stone called Moriah, or Zion. Stop and think about that for a moment. The Israelites had just left Egypt. They had learned, where they, there in Egypt, they had learned how to write on papyrus, how to paint on stones. That was the normal, normal way to write or communicate. In other areas of the world at that time, people were scrawling their writings into clay and then baking them, trying to get them to, 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 to be preserved. But they would also easily break. But at Mount Sinai, God chooses a different media. Exodus 31, 18. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him, he, the Lord, gave him, Moses, the two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. The Ten Commandments were carved into stone by God himself. Every other method wears or fades, but carved into stone by the very finger of God that's intended to be permanent. They were stored in a special container and housed in a special structure. And if these stones that Moses brought down, if these stones were to speak, and in a way they do, what might they say? This is the very will of God. This is important. <clears throat> these words are for all people, for all time. Remember them. Even the setting, the environment, the way that God gave the Ten Commandments, or all, all the commandments, was impressive. The top of the mountain was covered in smoke. Fire flashed from the sky. The entire mountain trembled at the voice of the trumpet-sounding voice of God as God thundered 
from on high. And the Hebrews were awestruck. And more than that, they were, they were scared to death. In fact, they pleaded with, with, with Moses, you go speak to God, for if God keeps speaking to us, we will certainly die. Hear this from Exodus 20, verses 18 through 21, and chapter 31, verse 18. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. The scene is horrifically awesome. The laws, commandments, commandments, right? Not suggestions, not, it would be a good idea if you were to try these proposals, but commandments carved into solid, heavy, permanent stone. And the people <clears throat> knew that these were the words of life and death, the way to live God's abundant way, to, to have God's very nature reflected in all that you do, words of eternity, foundations for our lives. These are God's law. These show us God. And these stones, by their very nature, command of God's people, this is where you stand. This is how you anchor your lives. It is with the Lord that you will live. These are the very will of God for you. Here is life. A couple of weeks ago, we heard the stones call us to build our lives on God's word. And Jesus said that when we do, it's like building our lives, our decisions, our hopes, our convictions, our actions upon a rock. And it's not building our lives on the shifting sands of self-desire. It is in obedience to this way of God that our lives are in turn built on the stable, solid rock. And here at Mount Sinai, God gives the solid, heavy, permanent foundation upon which to build. Take your stand here. Here with the Lord. At work, these stones remind us not to covet another's promotion. At home, the stones remind us that good life means honoring your father and mother. During the week, the best way to honor your work, your family, to, for your own energies, your own creativity, is to rest on the Sabbath. When you are out with friends, God tells us, that we're not to bear false witness against our neighbor. For when, when, when we tear down other people, we tear down the actual fabric of society. And all of this is summed up in the first commandment. That all this is in alignment with God's very nature. So when, when we do any action that is an affront to these ways of living, it's mostly an affront to God. And how, how timely on God's part, because as God was giving Moses these commandments on top of the, of the mountain, the people down below who had been scared had fashioned a golden calf as an idol. The idol and its worship they could fill with their own content, with what they wanted. They were afraid of God. They wanted to worship God right. They were missing Moses. They decided to make a, a golden calf, and things go from bad to worse. And by the time Moses comes down, they are worshiping themselves. They are indulging in, rel in, in revelry, and they got drunk and doing all kinds of things that were in violation to themselves, to violation to others, and in violation to God. And God's wrath thundered. I am the Lord your God. I am the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, 
I am the one who brought you out of a life of slavery. No, you shall have no other gods before me. Suddenly those who had bowed down to the golden calf found that all that they had created was nothing before the presence of God. It was another form of slavery. God had freed them from slavery and was pushing them to a life of fullness and abundance. And we often may think, or you and I, we, we may think about these Israelites that often think, how, how thick-headed can they be? Then we stop and pause for a moment. We realize we're not all that different. For we strive to follow God, and then we find ourselves along the way worshiping our own selfish desires. We come to the realization that serious, uh, that God takes his commandments seriously and seriously enough to have them carved into stone because we need to, have, to hear that consistent calling to abundant life over and over again. For we find that when we try and wander and try new things, that when we leave God's way, we are left with nothing. And it's building our lives on sand. Sometimes this realization comes slowly, painfully, only after we, set, we, we discover for ourselves that God gave these laws to help us, to bless us, to open up the path of life, that we to keep close to them is life. We need to stay connected to the source of mercy and life. God's very nature, God's will is made clear. These laws aren't heavy. They're not burdensome. They are a gift to the way of life. And they're carved into stone so that we can always see them and have them. If you look closely, you see this is exactly where Jesus stands. This Jesus we walk with who guides us to Jerusalem, the sinless, guiltless Son of God, stands on these stones. He stands on the side of God, of God's will, of God's plan. On the basis of God's law, he was not guilty. Pontius Pilate even said that Jesus was not guilty of the Roman laws. I find no case against him. But even so, Pontius Pilate gives Jesus over to the people. He says... Here is the man. And so now we find Jesus standing on stone pavements of a place of judgment called Gabbatha as Pilate sacrifices Jesus to the crowds. And as Jesus is standing on these smooth pavement stones, tile cobbled stones, Jesus there is taking his stand on God's way of life standing on the law of God, on the will of God, on the nature and character of God himself. In the face of all that he was pressured to do instead, Jesus takes his stand. He's taking his stand there on that smooth stone pavement, not for himself, but he's taking his stand for us. And just like the Hebrews who were liberated from bondage, just as God was taking them to the promised land, just like when God gave them the way of life and the Hebrews turned their back on God. So we have also turned our backs on God's will and law, desire and plan for our lives, even after God has freed us, directed us to hope, given us the message of life. We have bowed down to our golden calves of selfishness and self-centeredness. Whereas our as our um, liturgy of prayers of confession go, we have um, all broken God's law. We have rebelled. We have returned to bondage. We have denounced our Lord in word, in, in thought, word, and deed. But there stands Jesus, standing on the stones of Gabbatha, the place of judgment. Jesus stands there on God's law, standing there for you, fulfilling it for what we cannot do ourselves. Sinlessness, standing in for the sinful. Love, standing where hate ruled. 
Redemption, standing where re 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 rebellion destroyed. Jesus stands, innocent but convicted, standing in for us, we who are sinful but now acquitted. Have you ever considered how much those stone pavements on which Jesus was standing, those smooth tile cobbles, resemble the smooth tiled stone carried down by Moses from Sinai? There is an intentional similarity there. Jesus is taking his stand on those stones, a stand taken as one of us, a stand taken for all of us, fulfilling the full law of God, making it available to us in its fullness. He stands on those the stone tablets, the, the stone tablets from God with which he is fulfilling all the way to death for the very life that the law brings can be then given to us. As you near Jerusalem, what are the stones saying? What do they shout? They might be asking you, where do you stand? Because of Jesus, you have again the chance to stand on God's way, to choose God's way. He has freed us from our bondage to sin and is leading us toward the path of life. He is leading us to choose God's way. And he stands on the, on the stones of judgment, filling the, st the stones of the law in order to give us the chance to also choose God's way and to choose obedience, to choose to take our stand on the rock of life. You have pocket prayer rocks as we journey through Lent this year. Oh, I hope that they remind you that you have two choices. You can choose to seek what you want, how you want it, when you want it, the way you want it. Or you can choose to seek after what God wants, the kingdom of forgiveness, of love, of hope, of life. Jesus teaches, demonstrates, and fulfills that obedience to God. Dying to self leads then to abundant and eternal life. Let the rocks remind us that day after day, incident by incident, we are called to make a stand on God's way of life. Taking your stand on the solid rock, on God's way, may not be comfortable, or easy, certainly wasn't for Jesus. But the alternative is a deadly choice. It leads to sinking deep into the shifting sands of selflessness, of selfishness. Obedience, standing on the stones of God's plan, leads to life. Take your stand here, here with the Lord. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Today, we can choose God's way. We can choose Jesus. Standing on these stones, we can choose Him, His way, His obedience to obey God's law. We can choose to obey God's plan for our lives, to commit that, yes, I will obey and live live abundantly and eternally. This is where we choose to put our hope for our lives. This is where we choose to abide. This is where we choose to stand. Law given, law fulfilled. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, Christ, Jesus' blood and righteousness. We sing, our hope is on the solid rock.
Did you hear it there? I want you to go back to the, the fourth verse. I just, I just am so... Huh. Here's Jesus standing on the pavement stones for, and is condemned and innocently. He's standing there for you and me. And here's this hymn. When we stand with Jesus, we are dressed in the righteousness of the law that he achieves for us. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless, we can now stand before the throne. That's how we get to heaven, by standing with Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to go back to, uh, I referenced the prayer of confession. I'm going to just do this. I'm going to go back to the prayer of confession that we often say together as a church. It's, if you care, it's on page 8 of our hymnal. I'm going to pray this prayer as our prayer of confession. And then we're going to pray an uh, openness of asking God to, to make us stand on his way of life for ourselves, to, for our lives ahead this week. And then we'll close in the Lord's Prayer, standing with the conviction of Jesus Christ being our hope and our way of life. So we begin by praying prayers of confession of how we stand on sand, slippery ground, quicksand, to try to build our lives. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Jesus, standing on the stone judgment seat, stand, um, pavement stones, free us for joyful obedience. Fulfill this law for us. Give us your righteousness, we beg, so that through you we may have life abundant. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That is proof of, Jesus, of God's love for us through Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, you apply the victory that Jesus won, the faithfulness of Jesus to the way of abundant life, the fullness of the law fulfilled in Jesus where we have all one by one stumbled and faltered and failed and tripped and is sinking in sand. Apply to us the victory of Jesus, please. We choose Jesus. We we. we, we we, we um, struggle to climb up, to stand on the stone with him, the stone of your abundant life, the grounding of true eternal life. Stand us up with him, Holy Spirit. Apply to us his victory, his grace, and may your mercy pour out from your mercy seat upon us, to stand us up on solid ground, your way of life, O oh God. Give us the conviction to stand mightily for you, to stand to resolutely for you and your way of life in the world which calls us to every other way. We make our stand with you, Jesus. And we know that we can stand in your righteousness before the throne of God at the end of time, claiming the abundant life that you have given for us. Oh God, there's stuff waiting for us. Powers that seem strong, conflicts that seem overwhelming, life that is exhausting. There are powers and evils all around. There's temptations that, that call us, distract us, Waves that buffet and storms that crash. Neighbors and friends who even unknowingly come against us or, or, or pull us down. We stand on you, the solid rock, Jesus. Give us your Holy Spirit in a way where we can stand strong and mighty and live the good life. May your Holy Spirit pour into us and out through us so that we can stand faithfully and we can be the witness for all around of your great love. 
We pray for those who are struggling around us. We put our arm out to them, Lord, in prayer. We pray for you to be their strength. Those who are struggling, those who are in medical concerns, those who are relational concerns, those who are career problems, um, financial struggles, just um, relationships, family conundrums, those who are in sorrow, those who are grieving, those who are overwhelmed, those who are unable to see even your face. We, we lifted those on our prayer bulletin list before those in our own lives whom we love and care about, who you put in our pathways. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to stand on you, Jesus, in a way where we can offer this same hope to others who are floundering. And may we live as you have taught us. We pray this, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We see Jesus standing faithfully on the stone judgment, the stones of the law. And we see his cross there and we cry out, What wondrous love is this? Stand with me as we sing. Stand in resolution of commitment with, with Jesus. What wondrous love we see. Let's sing. We're going to continue singing um, and worshiping this week on Wednesday. We're going to come back together over the noontime for a noontime break. We're fasting at times over Lent. And so for our Lenten fast, Wednesday noon, skip lunch and um, come. If you can, if you're in driving distance to worship here, you can come here to this place. We worship together. Or if you're at work, take a break from your work and tune in to our Lenten noon worship service online. Or if you can put it in some other spot in your week, we invite you to go back and listen to that service. We're going to be engaging um, the ways that we live our faith inside out into the world as we live for Jesus. For Jesus made a public proclamation of life, and we do that same as well. Also, our um, registration is now open for our summer mega camp, mega kids camp. 
We invite you to share that with your, 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 your families and friends and neighbors. Get, and uh, you get, get your kids there too, of course. Sign up. Get them involved for that. Sign up is, is already filling up. Make sure you, 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 you do that. And well as the rest of us who aren't going to have kids who are going to the camp, we can volunteer and help out at this kids' camp time. So take that week and block it off on your calendar. And we'll, we'll show up here and, and we'll make a difference in passing on the gospel of Jesus Christ to the next gener generation. Also, um, coming up for Easter and thereafter, our, 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 our new push now is going to be for our food wall. Though the cry of hunger in our communities is desperate, the food um, has, been, has grown scarce. Food shelves are empty. The demand has increased. So the cry has gone out. We need to feed the people of our world around us. We, we know that Jesus loves them and we want them to know the spiritual food of Jesus. We deliver that in packages of physical food. So we're going to make this our push and our drive, our Easter push for April and into May, our, our food wall coming on May 7th. So make plans for that, and we're, we're going to get together, start bringing your food into the church. We're going we're, we're gonna, we're gonna to get our wall um, up and going, and we're going to have that be a testimony of how we, sh how we are the visible hands and feet of Jesus in our, our world. So we go back to now our memory verse. It will be our, our commitment for our week ahead, the way we will greet each day, the way we will greet every conflict, every trouble, everything that we face. We, we do this with this, with this vow. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. I invite you as we, as we get ready to leave now for, for you to remember that you extend the grace of Jesus to those around you. So take a, a moment be, be, before you leave. Turn and greet those folks around you. Tell them how much God likes them. And then also if you're at home, you can do that in your home as well. Turn around, tell people around you, God made you and he thinks you're pretty special. And you can do that wherever you go this, this week. And also as you leave, spend, spend a couple minutes out in the lobby. Go find someone you don't know very well and get to know them a, a little bit. Re remember the, 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 the mantra, hello, my name is... Well, you'd say your name, right? You know? And then they will give you your name back. And then name tags help, let me tell you. Name days help. Let's keep wearing those, those name days, especially as we're going to Easter. And we're expecting lots of people to come to ask about Jesus. We're going to be ready to greet them and welcome them. So I want to give you this last blessing as you go. So we shall receive this. May God the Father who made you for abundant life and who gave Jesus to make that way possible and open for you, give you now the Holy Spirit so you can walk your feet solidly on the rock of God's plan for your life, and you may live abundantly and eternally. Amen. Go in peace.